Book Two, Chapter One, Part Three of Three of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, Chapter One The Radiant Hour. Part Three of Three The Grey House. It is in the twenties that the actual momentum of life begins to slacken, and it is a simple soul indeed to whom as many things are significant and meaningful at thirty as at ten years before. At thirty an organ grinder is a more or less moth-eaten man who grinds an organ, and once he was an organ grinder. The unmistakable stigma of humanity touches all those impersonal and beautiful things that only youth ever grasps in their impersonal glory. A brilliant ball, gay with light romantic laughter, wears through its own silks and satins to show the bare framework of a man-made thing, oh, that eternal hand! A play, most tragic and most divine, becomes merely a succession of speeches, sweated over by the eternal plagiarist in the clammy hours, and acted by men subject to cramps, cowardice, and manly sentiment. And this time, with Gloria and Anthony, this first year of marriage, and the grey house caught them in that stage when the organ grinder was slowly undergoing his inevitable metamorphosis. She was twenty-three, he was twenty-six. The grey house was, at first, of sheerly pastoral intent. They lived impatiently in Anthony's apartment for the first fortnight after their return from California, in a stifled atmosphere of open trunks, too many collars, and the eternal laundry bags. They discussed with their friends the stupendous problem of their future. Dick and Maury would sit with them, agreeing solemnly, almost thoughtfully, as Anthony ran through his list of what they ought to do, and where they ought to live. "'I'd like to take Gloria abroad,' he complained, "'except for this damn war. And next to that, I'd sort of like to have a place in the country, somewhere near New York, of course, where I could write, or whatever I decide to do.' Gloria laughed. "'Isn't he cute?' she required of Maury, whatever he decides to do. But what am I going to do if he works? Maury, will you take me around if Anthony works? Anyway, I'm not going to work yet, said Anthony quickly. It was vaguely understood between them that on some misty day he would enter a sort of glorified diplomatic service and be envied by princes and prime ministers for his beautiful wife. Well, said Gloria helplessly, I'm sure I don't know. We talk and talk and never get anywhere, and we ask all our friends and they just answer the way we want them to. I wish somebody'd take care of us. Why don't you go out to, out to Greenwich or something, suggested Richard Caramel. I'd like that, said Gloria, brightening. Do you think we could get a house there? Dick shrugged his shoulders and Maury laughed. You two amuse me, he said, of all the impractical people. As soon as a place is mentioned, you expect us to pull great piles of photographs out of our pockets, showing the different styles of architecture available in bungalows. That's just what I don't want, wailed Gloria. A hot, stuffy bungalow, with a lot of babies next door and their father cutting the grass in his shirt sleeves. For heaven's sake, Gloria, interrupted Maury, nobody wants to lock you up in a bungalow. Who in God's name brought bungalows into the conversation? but you'll never get a place anywhere unless you go out and hunt for it. Go where? You say go out and hunt for it, but where? With dignity, Moray waved his hand paw-like about the room. Out anywhere. Out in the country. There are lots of places. Thanks. Look here, Richard Caramel brought his yellow eye rakishly into play. The trouble with you two is that you're all disorganized. Do you know anything about New York State? Shut up, Anthony. I'm talking to Gloria. Well, she admitted finally, I've been to two or three house parties in Port Chester and around in Connecticut, but of course that isn't in New York State, is it? And neither is Morristown, she finished with drowsy irrelevance. There was a shout of laughter. Oh, Lord, cried Dick, neither is Morristown. No, and neither is Santa Barbara, Gloria. Now listen, to begin with, unless you have a fortune, there's no use considering any place like Newport or Southampton or Tuxedo. They're out of the question. They all agreed to this solemnly. And personally, I hate New Jersey. Then, of course, there's Upper New York, above Tuxedo. Too cold, said Gloria briefly. I was there once in an automobile. 
Well, it seems to me that there are a lot of towns like Rye between New York and Greenwich where you could buy a little gray house of some... Gloria leaped at the phrase triumphantly. For the first time since their return east, she knew what she wanted. Oh, yes, she cried. Oh, yes, that's it. A little gray house with sort of white around and a whole lot of swamp maples just as brown and gold as an October picture in a gallery. Where can we find one? Unfortunately, I've mislaid my list of little gray houses with swamp maples around them, but I'll try to find it. Meanwhile, you take a piece of paper and write down the names of seven possible towns, and every day this week you take a trip to one of those towns. Oh, gosh, protested Gloria, collapsing mentally. Why won't you do it for us? I hate trains. Well, hire a car and... Gloria yawned. I'm tired of discussing it. Seems to me all we do is talk about where to live. My exquisite wife wearies of thought, remarked Anthony ironically. She must have a tomato sandwich to stimulate her jaded nerves. Let's go out to tea. As the unfortunate upshot of this conversation, they took Dick's advice literally, and two days later went out to Rye, where they wandered around with an irritated real estate agent like bewildered babes in the wood. They were shown houses at a hundred a month, which closely adjoined other houses at a hundred a month. They were shown isolated houses to which they invariably took violent dislikes, though they submitted weakly to the agent's desire that they look at that stove, some stove, into a great shaking of doorposts and tapping of walls, intended, evidently, to show that the house would not immediately collapse, no matter how convincingly it gave that impression. They gazed through windows into interiors furnished either commercially, with slab-like chairs and unyielding settees, or home-like, with the melancholy bric-a-brac of other summers, crossed tennis rackets, fit-form couches, and depressing Gibson girls. With a feeling of guilt, they looked at a few really nice houses, aloof, dignified and cool, at three hundred a month. They went away from Rye thanking the real estate agent very much indeed. On the crowded train back to New York, the seat behind was occupied by a super-respirating Latin whose last few meals had obviously been composed entirely of garlic. They reached the apartment gratefully, almost hysterically, and Gloria rushed for a hot bath in the reproachless bathroom. So far as the question of a future abode was concerned, both of them were incapacitated for a week. The matter eventually worked itself out with unhoped-for romance. Anthony ran into the living room one afternoon, fairly radiating the idea. "'I've got it!' he was exclaiming, as though he had just caught a mouse. "'We'll get a car!' "'Gee whiz! Haven't we got troubles enough taking care of ourselves? "'Give me a second to explain, can't you? "'Just let's leave our stuff with Dick, and just pile a couple of suitcases in our car, "'the one we're going to buy, we'll have to have one in the country anyway, "'and just start out in the direction of New Haven. "'You see, as we get out of commuting distance from New York, the rents'll get cheaper.' and as soon as we find a house we want, we'll just settle down. By his frequent and soothing interpolation of the word just, he aroused her lethargic enthusiasm. Strutting violently about the room, he simulated a dynamic and irresistible efficiency. We'll buy a car tomorrow. Life, limping after imagination's ten-league boots, saw them out of town a week later in a cheap but sparkling new roadster, saw them through the chaotic, unintelligible Bronx, then over a wide, murky district which alternated cheerless blue-green wastes with suburbs of tremendous and sordid activity. They left New York at eleven, and it was well past a hot and beatific noon when they moved rakishly through Pelham. "'These aren't towns,' said Gloria scornfully. "'These are just city blocks plumped down coldly into waste acres. I imagine all the men here have their mustaches stained from drinking their coffee too quickly in the morning.' and play pinochle on the commuting trains. What's pinochle? Don't be so literal. How should I know? But it sounds as though they ought to play it. I like it. It sounds as if it were something where you sort of cracked your knuckles or something. Let me drive. Anthony looked at her suspiciously. You swear you're a good driver? Since I was fourteen. He stopped the car cautiously at the side of the road, and they changed seats. Then, with a horrible grinding noise, the car was put in gear, Gloria adding an accompaniment of laughter which seemed to Anthony disquieting and in the worst possible taste. "'Here we go!' she yelled. "'Whoop!' 
Their heads snapped back like marionettes on a single wire as the car leaped ahead and curved retchingly about a standing milk wagon, whose driver stood up on his seat and bellowed after them. In the immemorial tradition of the road, Anthony retorted with a few brief epigrams as to the grossness of the milk-delivering profession. He cut his remarks short, however, and turned to Gloria with the growing conviction that he had made a grave mistake in relinquishing control, and that Gloria was a driver of many eccentricities and of infinite carelessness. "'Remember now,' he warned her nervously, "'the man said we oughtn't to go over twenty miles an hour for the first five thousand miles.' She nodded briefly, but evidently intending to accomplish the prohibitive distance as quickly as possible, slightly increased her speed. A moment later he made another attempt. "'See that sign? Do you want to get us pinched?' "'Oh, for heaven's sake!' cried Gloria in exasperation. "'You always exaggerate things so.' "'Well, I don't want to get arrested.' "'Who's arresting you? You're so persistent, just like you were about my cough medicine last night.' "'It was for your own good.' Ha! I might as well be living with Mama. What a thing to say to me! A standing policeman swerved into view, was hastily passed. See him? demanded Anthony. Oh, you drive me crazy. He didn't arrest us, did he? When he does, it'll be too late, countered Anthony brilliantly. Her reply was scornful, almost injured. Why, this old thing won't go over thirty-five. It isn't old. It is in spirit. That afternoon the car joined the laundry bags and Gloria's appetite as one of the trinity of contention. He warned her of railroad tracks, he pointed out approaching automobiles, finally he insisted on taking the wheel and a furious, insulted Gloria sat silently beside him between the towns of Larchmont and Rye. But it was due to this furious silence of hers that the grey house materialized from its abstraction, for just beyond Rye he surrendered gloomily to it and re-relinquished the wheel. Mutely he beseeched her, and Gloria, instantly cheered, vowed to be more careful. But because a discourteous street-car persisted callously in remaining upon its track, Gloria ducked down a side street, and thereafter that afternoon was never able to find her way back to the post-road. The street they finally mistook for it lost its post-road aspect when it had gone five miles from Cos Cobb. Its macadam became gravel, then dirt, Moreover, it narrowed and developed a border of maple trees, through which filtered the westering sun, making its endless experiments with shadow designs upon the long grass. "'We're lost now,' complained Anthony. "'Read that sign.' "'Marietta, five miles. What's Marietta?' "'Never heard of it, but let's go on. We can't turn here, and there's probably a detour back to the post-road.' The way became scarred with deepening ruts and insidious shoulders of stone. Three farmhouses faced them momentarily, slid by. A town sprang up in a cluster of dull roofs around a white tall steeple. Then Gloria, hesitating between two approaches and making her choice too late, drove over a fire hydrant and ripped the transmission violently from the car. It was dark when the real estate agent of Marietta showed them the gray house. They came upon it just west of the village where it rested against the sky that was a warm blue cloak buttoned with tiny stars. The grey house had been there when women who kept cats were probably witches, when Paul Revere made false teeth in Boston preparatory to arousing the great commercial people, when our ancestors were gloriously deserting Washington in droves. Since those days the house had been bolstered up in a feeble corner, considerably repartitioned and newly plastered inside, amplified by a kitchen and added to by a side porch, but, save for where some jovial oaf had roofed the new kitchen with red tin, colonial it defiantly remained. "'How did you happen to come to Marietta?' demanded the real estate agent, in a tone that was first cousin to suspicion. He was showing them through four spacious and airy bedrooms. "'We broke down,' explained Gloria. "'I drove over a fire hydrant and we had ourselves towed to the garage, and then we saw your sign.' The man nodded, unable to follow such a sally of spontaneity. There was something subtly immoral in doing anything without several months' consideration. They signed a lease that night, and, in the agent's car, returned jubilantly to the somnolent and dilapidated Marietta Inn, which was too broken even for the chance immoralities and consequent gaieties of a country roadhouse. Half the night they lay awake, planning the things they were to do there. 
Anthony was going to work at an astounding pace on his history, and thus ingratiate himself with his cynical grandfather. When the car was repaired, they would explore the country and join the nearest really nice club, where Gloria would play golf or something, while Anthony wrote. This, of course, was Anthony's idea. Gloria was sure she wanted but to read and dream, and be fed tomato sandwiches and lemonades by some angelic servant still in a shadowy hinterland. Between paragraphs, Anthony would come and kiss her as she lay indolently in the hammock. The hammock! A host of new dreams in tune to its imagined rhythm, while the heat stirred it, and waves of sun undulated over the shadows of blown wheat, or the dusty road freckled and darkened with quiet summer rain. And guests, here they had a long argument, both of them trying to be extraordinarily mature and far-sighted. Anthony claimed that they would need people at least every other weekend as a sort of change. This provoked and involved an extremely sentimental conversation as to whether Anthony did not consider Gloria change enough. Though he assured her that he did, she insisted upon doubting him. Eventually the conversation assumed its eternal monotone. What then? Oh, what'll we do then? Well, we'll have a dog, suggested Anthony. I don't want one. I want a kitty. She went thoroughly and with great enthusiasm into the history, habits, and tastes of a cat she had once possessed. Anthony considered that it must have been a horrible character, with neither personal magnetism nor a loyal heart. Later they slept, to wake an hour before dawn with the grey house dancing in phantom glory before their dazzled eyes. THE SOUL OF GLORIA for that autumn the grey house welcomed them with a rush of sentiment that falsified its cynical old age. True, there were the laundry bags, there was Gloria's appetite, there was Anthony's tendency to brood and his imaginative nervousness, but there were intervals also of an unhoped-for serenity. Close together on the porch they would wait for the moon to stream across the silver acres of farmland, jump a thick wood, and tumble waves of radiance at their feet. In such a moonlight Gloria's face was of a pervading, reminiscent white, and with a modicum of effort they would slip off the blinders of custom, and each would find in the other almost the quintessential romance of the vanished June. One night, while her head lay upon his heart, and their cigarettes glowed in swerving buttons of light through the dome of darkness over the bed, she spoke for the first time, and fragmentarily, of the men who had hung for brief moments on her beauty. Do you ever think of them? he asked her. Only occasionally, when something happens that recalls a particular man. What do you remember? Their kisses? All sorts of things. Men are different with women. Different in what way? Oh, entirely, and quite inexpressibly. Men who had the most firmly rooted reputation for being this way or that way would sometimes be surprisingly inconsistent with me. Brutal men were tender, negligible men were astonishingly loyal and lovable, and often honorable men took attitudes that were anything but honorable. For instance? Well, there was a boy named Percy Walcott from Cornell who was quite a hero in college, a great athlete, and saved a lot of people from a fire, or something like that, but I soon found he was stupid in a rather dangerous way. What way? It seems he had some naive conception of a woman fit to be his wife, a particular conception that I used to run into a lot, and that always drove me wild. He demanded a girl who'd never been kissed, and who liked to sew and sit home and pay tribute to his self-esteem. And I'll bet a hat, if he's gotten an idiot to sit and be stupid with him, he's tearing out on the side with some much speedier lady. I'd be sorry for his wife. I wouldn't. Think what an ass she'd be not to realize it before she married him. He's the sort whose idea of honoring and respecting a woman would be never to give her any excitement. With the best intentions, he was deep in the dark ages." What was his attitude toward you? I'm coming to that. As I told you, or did I tell you, he was mighty good-looking. Big brown, honest eyes, and one of those smiles that guarantee the heart behind it is twenty-carat gold. Being young and credulous, I thought he had some discretion, so I kissed him fervently one night while we were riding around after a dance at the homestead at Hot Springs. It had been a wonderful week, I remember, with the most luscious trees spread out like green lather, sort of, all over the valley and a mist rising out of them on October mornings like bonfires lit to turn them brown. "'How about your friend with the ideals?' interrupted Anthony. 
It seems that when he kissed me he began to think that perhaps he could get away with a little more, that I needn't be respected like this Beatrice Fairfax glad girl of his imagination. What did he do? Not much. I pushed him off a sixteen-foot embankment before he was well started. Hurt him? inquired Anthony with a laugh. Broke his arm and sprained his ankle. He told the story all over Hot Springs, and when his arm healed a man named Barley who liked me fought him and broke it over again. Oh, it was an awful mess. He threatened to sue Barley, and Barley, he was from Georgia, was seen buying a gun in town. But before that Mama had dragged me north again, much against my will, so I never did find out all that happened, though I saw Barley once in the Vanderbilt lobby. Anthony laughed long and loud. What a career! I suppose I ought to be furious because you've kissed so many men. I'm not, though. At this she sat up in bed. It's funny, but I'm so sure that those kisses left no mark on me, no taint of promiscuity, I mean, even though a man once told me in all seriousness that he hated to think I'd been a public drinking glass. He had his nerve. I just laughed and told him to think of me rather as a loving cup that goes from hand to hand but should be valued none the less. Somehow it doesn't bother me. On the other hand, it would, of course, if you'd done any more than kiss them. But I believe you're absolutely incapable of jealousy except as hurt vanity. Why don't you care what I've done? Wouldn't you prefer it if I'd been absolutely innocent? It's all in the impression it might have made on you. My kisses were because the man was good-looking, or because there was a slick moon, or even because I felt vaguely sentimental and a little stirred. But that's all. It's had utterly no effect on me. But you'd remember and let memories haunt you and worry you. Haven't you ever kissed anyone like you've kissed me? No, she answered simply. As I've told you, men have tried, oh, lots of things. Any pretty girl has that experience. You see, she resumed, it doesn't matter to me how many women you've stayed with in the past, so long as it was merely a physical satisfaction, but I don't believe I could endure the idea of your ever having lived with another woman for a protracted period, or even having wanted to marry some possible girl. It's different somehow. There'd be all the little intimacies remembered, and they'd dull the freshness that, after all, is the most precious part of love. Rapturously, he pulled her down beside him on the pillow. Oh, my darling, he whispered, as if I remembered anything but your dear kisses. Then Gloria, in a very mild voice, Anthony, did I hear anybody say they were thirsty? Anthony laughed abruptly, and with a sheepish and amused grin got out of bed. With just a little piece of ice in the water, she added, do you suppose I could have that? Gloria used the adjective little whenever she asked a favor. It made the favor sound less arduous. But Anthony laughed again. Whether she wanted a cake of ice or a marble of it, he must go downstairs to the kitchen. Her voice followed him through the hall. And just a little cracker with just a little marmalade on it? Oh, gosh, sighed Anthony in rapturous slang. She's wonderful, that girl. She has it. When we have a baby, she began one day. This, it had already been decided, was to be after three years. I want it to look like you. Except its legs, he insinuated slyly. Oh, yes, except his legs. He's got to have my legs. But the rest of him can be you. My nose? Gloria hesitated. Well, perhaps my nose, but certainly your eyes and my mouth, and I guess my shape of the face. I wonder, I think he'd be sort of cute if he had my hair. My dear Gloria, you've appropriated the whole baby. Well, I didn't mean to, she apologized cheerfully. Let him have my neck at least, he urged, regarding himself gravely in the glass. You've often said you liked my neck because the Adam's apple doesn't show, and, besides, your neck's too short. Why, it is not, she cried indignantly, turning to the mirror. It's just right. I don't believe I've ever seen a better neck. It's too short, he repeated teasingly. Short? Her tone expressed exasperated wonder. Short? You're crazy. She elongated and contracted it to convince herself of its reptilian sinuousness. Do you call that a short neck? One of the shortest I've ever seen. For the first time in weeks tears started from Gloria's eyes, and the look she gave him had a quality of real pain. Oh, Anthony! My lord, Gloria! He approached her in bewilderment and took her elbows in his hands. Don't cry, please! Didn't you know I was only kidding? Gloria, look at me! 
Why, dearest, you've got the longest neck I've ever seen, honestly. Her tears dissolved in a twisted smile. Well, you shouldn't have said that, then. Let's talk about the b baby. Anthony paced the floor and spoke as though rehearsing for a debate. To put it briefly, there are two babies we could have, two distinct and logical babies, utterly differentiated. There's the baby that's the combination of the best of both of us, your body, my eyes, my mind, your intelligence, and then there is the baby which is our worst, my body, your disposition, and my irresolution. I like that second baby, she said. What I'd really like, continued Anthony, would be to have two sets of triplets one year apart, and then experiment with the six boys. Poor me, she interjected. I'd educate them each in a different country and by a different system, and when they were twenty-three I'd call them together and see what they were like. Let's have them all with my neck, suggested Gloria. The End of a Chapter The car was at length repaired, and with a deliberate vengeance took up where it left off the business of causing infinite dissension. Who should drive? How fast should Gloria go? These two questions and the eternal recriminations involved ran through the days. They motored to the post-road towns, Rye, Portchester, and Greenwich, and called on a dozen friends, mostly Gloria's, who all seemed to be in different stages of having babies, and in this respect as well as in others, bored her to a point of nervous distraction. For an hour after each visit, she would bite her fingers furiously and be inclined to take out her rancor on Anthony. I loathe women, she cried in a mild temper. What on earth can you say to them, except talk lady lady? I've enthused over a dozen babies that I've wanted only to choke, and every one of those girls is either incipiently jealous and suspicious of her husband if he's charming, or beginning to be bored with him if he isn't. Don't you ever intend to see any women? I don't know. They never seem clean to me. Never, never. Except just a few. Constance Shaw, you know, the Mrs. Merriam who came over to see us last Tuesday, is almost the only one. She's so tall and fresh-looking and stately. I don't like them so tall. Though they went to several dinner dances at various country clubs, they decided that the autumn was too nearly over for them to go out on any scale, even had they been so inclined. He hated golf. Gloria liked it only mildly, and though she enjoyed a violent rush that some undergraduates gave her one night, and was glad that Anthony should be proud of her beauty, she also perceived that their hostess for the evening, a Mrs. Granby, was somewhat disquieted by the fact that Anthony's classmate, Alec Granby, joined with enthusiasm in the rush. The Granbys never phoned again, and though Gloria laughed, it piqued her not a little. You see, she explained to Anthony, if I wasn't married it wouldn't worry her, but she's been to the movies in her day, and she thinks I may be a vampire. But the point is that placating such people requires an effort that I'm simply unwilling to make, and those cute little freshmen making eyes at me and paying me idiotic compliments. I've grown up, Anthony. Marietta itself offered little social life. Half a dozen farm estates formed a hectagon around it, but these belonged to ancient men who displayed themselves only as inert, gray thatched lumps in the back of limousines on their way to the station, whither they were sometimes accompanied by equally ancient and doubly massive wives. The townspeople were a particularly uninteresting type. Unmarried females were predominant for the most part, with school festival horizons and souls bleak as the forbidding white architecture of the three churches. The only native with whom they came in close contact was the broad-hipped, broad-shouldered Swedish girl who came every day to do their work. She was silent and efficient, and Gloria, after finding her weeping violently into her bowed arms upon the kitchen table, developed an uncanny fear of her and stopped complaining about the food. Because of her untold and esoteric grief, the girl stayed on. Gloria's penchant for premonitions and her bursts of vague supernaturalism were a surprise to Anthony. Either some complex, properly and scientifically inhibited in the early years with her bilfistic mother, or some inherited hypersensitiveness, made her susceptible to any suggestion of the psychic, and, far from gullible about the motives of people, she was inclined to credit any extraordinary happening attributed to the whimsical perambulations of the buried. The desperate squeakings about the old house on windy nights, that to Anthony were burglars with revolvers ready in hand, represented to Gloria the auras, evil and restive, of dead generations, 
expiating the inexpiable upon the ancient and romantic hearth. One night, because of two swift bangs downstairs, which Anthony fearfully but unavailingly investigated, they lay awake nearly until dawn, asking each other examination paper questions about the history of the world. In October, Muriel came out for a two weeks visit. Gloria had called her on long distance, and Miss Kane ended the conversation characteristically by saying, All righty, I'll be there with bells. She arrived with a dozen popular songs under her arm. You ought to have a phonograph out here in the country, she said. Just a little, Vic. They don't cost much. Then, whenever you're lonesome, you can have Caruso or Al Jolson right at your door. She worried Anthony to distraction by telling him that he was the first clever man she had ever known, and she got so tired of shallow people. He wondered that people fell in love with such women. Yet he supposed that under a certain impassioned glance even she might take on a softness and promise. But Gloria, violently showing off her love for Anthony, was diverted into a state of purring content. Finally, Richard Caramel arrived for a garrulous and to Gloria painfully literary weekend, during which he discussed himself with Anthony long after she lay in childlike sleep upstairs. "'It's been mighty funny, this success and all,' said Dick. "'Just before the novel appeared I'd been trying, without success, to sell some short stories. Then, after my book came out, I polished up three and had them accepted by one of the magazines that had rejected them before. I've done a lot of them since. Publishers don't pay me for my book till this winter. Don't let the victor belong to the spoils. You mean write trash? He considered. If you mean deliberately injecting a slushy fade-out into each one, I'm not. But I don't suppose I'm being so careful. I'm certainly writing faster, and I don't seem to be thinking as much as I used to. Perhaps it's because I don't get any conversation, now that you're married and Maury's gone to Philadelphia. Haven't the old urge and ambition, early success and all that. Doesn't it worry you? Frantically. I get a thing I call sentence fever that must be like buck fever. It's a sort of intense literary self-consciousness that comes when I try to force myself. But the really awful days aren't when I think I can't write. They're when I wonder when any writing is worth while at all. I mean, whether I'm not a sort of glorified buffoon. I like to hear you talk that way, said Anthony, with a touch of his old patronizing insolence. I was afraid you'd gotten a bit idiotic over your work. Read the damnedest interview you gave out. Dick interrupted with an agonized expression. Good Lord, don't mention it. Young lady wrote it. Most admiring young lady. Kept telling me my work was strong, and I sort of lost my head and made a lot of strange pronouncements. Some of it was good, though, don't you think? Oh, yes. That part about the wise writer writing for the youth of his generation, the critic of the next, and the schoolmaster of ever afterward. Oh, I believe a lot of it, admitted Richard Caramel with a faint beam. It was simply a mistake to give it out. In November they moved into Anthony's apartment, from which they sallied triumphantly to the Yale-Harvard and Harvard-Princeton football games, to the St. Nicholas ice-skating rink, to a thorough round of the theaters, and to a miscellany of entertainments, from small staid dances to the great affairs that Gloria loved held in those few houses where lackeys with powdered wigs scurried around in magnificent anglomania under the direction of gigantic major-domos. Their intention was to go abroad the first of the year, or, at any rate, when the war was over. Anthony had actually completed a Chestertonian essay on the twelfth century by way of introduction to his proposed book, and Gloria had done some extensive research work on the question of Russian sable coats. In fact, the winter was approaching quite comfortably, when the bilfistic demiurge decided suddenly in mid-December that Mrs. Gilbert's soul had aged sufficiently in its present incarnation. In consequence, Anthony took a miserable and hysterical Gloria out to Kansas City, where, in the fashion of mankind, they paid the terrible and mind-shaking deference to the dead. Mr. Gilbert became, for the first and last time in his life, a truly pathetic figure. That woman he had broken to wait upon his body and play congregation to his mind had ironically deserted him just when he could not much longer have supported her never again would he be able so satisfactorily to bore and bully a human soul end of book two chapter one part three of three